this day in history Death is beaten, you have rescued me Sing it out, Jesus is alive The empty cross, the empty grave Life eternal, you have won the day Shout it out, Jesus is alive Your praise and lift high the name. 
Let's sing that one more time. We will sing, sing, sing. We will sing, sing, sing. And make music with the bones. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. And lift high the name of Jesus. can't separate even if I ran away your love never fails I know I still make mistakes but you have new mercies for me every day your love never fails Stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me The wind is strong and the water's deep I'm not alone here in these open seas Cause your love never fails The chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side your love never fails You stay You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes It may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Cause I know that you love me Oh, your love never fails Your love never fails Cause you make all things work together for my good You make all things work together for my good You make All things work together for my good Oh, we glorify your name All things work together for my good Lord, you are worthy I know that you love me Oh, your love never fails Your love never fails Your love never fails No, no, no Love never fails.
Well, can you figure out where I'm at? It's Fine Pasture Bob. Any clues coming to your mind? I'm in a plaid shirt. You can hear my voice if you've been able to figure, am I at home? Am I in the prayer chapel? I'm on campus somewhere. Where am I? Have you figured it out yet? Let me give you a clue. I'm on the northeast side of our building. That's a big clue. Here's another clue. I, I don't know where I'm at on the camp. Can you see where I'm at yet? I'm in my office. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's good to see you. That idea was Melanie's. Um, I've got some announcements I want to give to you today before we get talking on some other things. I want you all know we miss you very, very much. Uh, our building is just not... We're, we're here to see people, and uh, when we don't see people, it's just sad. And so my heart is sad because I don't see you. Now, you might see me and Daniel, Zach, and Oscar, and others will see on Facebook, but there's just something about face-to-face -face communication, and I miss you. And so I hope that you're doing well. Our youth group is still meeting with Zoom on Wednesday nights. If you've got teenagers at home, make sure that they're responding to Zach's emails or text messages, dialing on that. I hear they're having a good time, as good as they can have with that. Uh, small groups are meeting through Zoom. Uh, the Bebout group is met through Zoom. The Young Adults, the Murphy group. Uh, I know that the, B, uh, the Bouchon group and the, uh, the Kirk group, they're trying to get something started through Zoom. Uh, being aware of that. Our prayer meetings meeting through Zoom uh, on Wednesday nights. It's just a time to get together and pray and and see faces uh, and then we have devotionals we're posting on Facebook every day uh, one of our elders or staff members are writing something for you to read uh, I know many of you are on Facebook and so uh, screws over that and see uh, what's there for you to, to help set your heart right for the, the day ahead uh, prayer requests if you have some we sure would love to know what they are um, I know that many are losing their jobs and are struggling with finances and we would like to pray for you and uh, let us know how we can pray for you. You're not alone uh, in that. Uh, there's many in our church who have notified us of, of their layoffs and the stressors at work. And so let us let us reach out to you and reach back to us and let us be able to pray for you in, in that. And if you have any needs, um, we would love to be able to help. Lots of folks have dropped off groceries here at the church and, and we'd like to pass those out. And so if you have some food needs or know somebody who does, uh, reach out to us and, and we, we might have something there uh, for them as well. Easter Sunday is coming. They can't cancel Easter. Nobody can cancel Easter. It's a historical event that is taking place. So we might not be able to meet here like we usually do, but Easter is coming. And we're looking forward to celebrating that. Uh, we're going to do it in a unique way. And so here are some of the tentative plans because as you know, everything changes uh, pretty rapidly. Here's the idea. What about a, a patio service on Easter Sunday? Maybe we start at 8.15 and it's just a 15, 20 minute service. We can meet in the courtyard that we work so hard to get ready for Easter. Um, and we can space out six feet away from each other. And uh, we can have a little, some prayer. We can have reading the Easter story. We can share a brief message, maybe sing a song and uh, give each other air high fives as we all leave. But at least we can see each other. And I think that's a big part of our healing. I think if you isolate yourself uh, you create an environment for depression, uh, really sadness and anxiety and fear. It all kind of grows in, uh, in a, an environment where you're, you're alone and you're only watching, you know, either Fox News or CNN or, or what's on Facebook uh, feeds. And so let's get together on Easter Sunday at 815 and, and try to do this. And so I'll stay in touch with Facebook and email and text messages. We'll let you know for certain because we've got to work through this of how we can do it in a way that would honor our governing authorities, but at the same time minister to the needs of our of our hearts. And uh, we all have these very important needs. And then we'll have an online service after on Easter Sunday. So if, if you feel good about coming up at 815, great. If not, we'll still put something online uh, for everyone to share. And then we're working on a uh, Easter scavenger hunt. So here's the idea. We'll put together a crossword puzzle It'll have 10 questions on it, and we're going to find 10 houses that are close to the church in this area, and the kids will get this crossword puzzle. Then they'll uh, go to the addresses that we give, and at that address will be the Bible verse that answers one of the questions on the crossword puzzle. So you'll grab your Bibles, you grab your children, or if you want to do it as an adult, high school, that's all good. You take that your Bible, you find the first address, and you go to that address, answer that question uh, that's found in that verse, and then go to the next address. There's 10 addresses total. And then when you're all done, you bring your sheet here to the church. And we'll be here from 2 to 4 o'clock on Easter Sunday, and we'll give you an Easter basket, kind of an award uh, for doing this. 
and something special to do with the kids or with, with adults. It doesn't, there's no age limit on this, but it would be a good time. And you'd be reading the Easter story, you'd be looking up the Bible verses, how could this be bad? And uh, the folks that uh, host a uh, Bible verse in their yard, what they'll do is they'll just take the somehow display the verse in their yard. It could be on a window with, with a, I don't know, some window foam. They can write it in chalk on the driveway. They can write it on a wall on their driveway. But it, all it is is you'll write the verse uh, that uh, we give you on your property somewhere. It could be in stencils on your yard, just however you want to do it. And then when the people drive up, they don't have to get out of the car. They can just drive up, look at the verse, turn it in their Bibles, scroll to it, and then answer the question and go to the next house. Once they get all 10 done, they drive up to the church uh, and then they'll uh, get the reward. If you'll let us know if that be something you would do, we'll send out invites. And if you'll RSVP, that way we know how many prizes to get. How we don't buy a bunch and then nobody comes or we don't have enough. And so let us know. You'll see that online in some way or another. Um, you know, I believe God is going to use this time in, in our lives many ways. Uh, I always try to look for a silver lining. So um, I think a couple of things. One is we do, sure do learn to appreciate our freedoms. I do. I don't like being told I can't leave my house. Um, I don't even want to go anywhere, but when they tell me I can't go, then I, I, I want to go somewhere. And so I'm learning to appreciate my freedoms. I love our schools and our teachers. When you pray for our teachers, we have a lot of them at our church, and they're under a lot of pressure, and uh, they're doing a lot of hard work. But our, our parents are also learning that it's hard to teach. And so there's a greater appreciation for our teachers. We're re reminded that the most important unit, unit in our society is the family got to have a strong family, a strong marriage, and maybe you're going through this period where, wow, we need to work on our marriage. Well, that's a good thing. Uh, then maybe we uh, work out a way to, to help meet that need. I think we're learning that. I think we're learning that people matter most. Uh, I miss people. I, I don't miss things. Uh, I miss, miss seeing you, and I miss seeing uh, so many people that I'm just familiar with. I appreciate uh, the little things that seem to be major. I miss all the little things that I've enjoyed. Uh, I'm learning to be content. What about you? The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. But that verse is anchored in a, a section on contentment. Can you stay at home and be content with what you have? Uh, and I've seen posts, Oscar's doing this a lot. He's remodeling different rooms. He's learning to enjoy what he has and uh, to make it special and just doing things there at home and enjoying God's blessings and uh, learning to be content. I'm learning to be still. Scripture says, be still and know that I am God. And so stay home, don't move, be still. And you've learned that, that God is sovereign over all things. I was reminded uh, just a little while ago, James 4, 13, it says this, Come now you who say, today or tomorrow we, go, we will go to such and such a place and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. We've done that. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. These are my plans. James says, watch out. Um, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or do that. So I'm learning through all of this that all of the plans that I've had, that you've had, that we've all had, we've got to hold on loosely to these things because they get changed. You know, the next week things are going to change. So we have to continuously surrender our plans to the Lord and trust Him in all of this. And so I hope you're learning spiritual things through this because this is a major upheaval. So if you're feeling that anxiety, that fear, sadness, and, and uneasiness at home, you're normal. That's what we all feel. Go to Psalm 46.10 and learn to be still and know that He is God and trust Him. Some of you have lost your jobs and so there's, what are we going to do for money? What are we going to do for after this all goes away? How are we going to find a new normal? Seek the Lord during those times. Keep engaging with church family. Uh, I can't wait to see you again. One day we're going to have a big opening Sunday. I hope it's May 3rd. I don't know when it's going to be, but I'm praying for May 3rd, and we're going to get together and have a reopening of church, and it is going to be a blessing. And uh, we'll be able to share what God has given us and what God has taught us. And if you'd like to post some of those things that you're learning to appreciate on Facebook, please do, so that we can see what God's doing inside of your life. Because Zach and I and Daniel, we've Deborah, Ashley, we just talked about how we miss seeing you and uh, seeing what God is doing in your life and celebrating the blessings. And so thank you for being with us this morning. We're going to preach here in just a little while or a little Bible study. But I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of those things that are on my heart, things that are coming up and that we look forward to doing with you soon. So the Lord bless you and thanks for spending time with us this morning.
When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how He picked me up, turned me around, how He placed my feet on solid ground. Makes me want to shout Hallelujah Thank you Jesus Lord you're worthy Of all of the glory And all of the honor And all of the praise It makes me want to shout Hallelujah Thank you Jesus Lord you're worthy Of all of the glory All of the honor And all of the praise saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost and how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up, turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. Oh, it makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. It makes me want to shout. Makes me want to shout. When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord. Makes me want to shout when I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how He picked me up. Turn me around, how we place my feet oh, on solid ground. Oh, it makes me want to shout. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. Oh, it makes me want to shout. My God is real. Yeah, He's real in my soul. My God is real, for He has cleansed and made me whole. His love for me is like pure gold. God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. You may not know just how it felt when Jesus washed all my sin, my 
passing away But from that day That very hour I knew my God was real For I could feel His holy power My God is real Yeah, he's real in my soul. He's real in my soul. My God is real, for he has cleansed and made me whole. And his love for me is like pure gold. It's like pure gold. My God is real. Just how it felt When Jesus was All my sin My sin away But from that day That very hour yeah, I knew my God was real Holy power, my God is real. My God is real. Oh, He's real in my soul. He's real in my soul. My God is real, for He has cleansed, made me whole. His love for me. Like your ghost, it's like your ghost. I said, My God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. Father, we just thank you, Lord. God, because you are the one true God, Father. You are the one true God. You are real, Father, and I just pray this morning, God, that you would just let us feel your presence in such a way, God, that there's just no way, absolutely no way to deny, Father, that our God is real. We thank you, Lord, and we thank you for Jesus. We give him all the glory. In his name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Daniel Perez. I'm the pastor of the Hispanic ministry in Odessa Bible Church. And today I want to share with you something that is happening in this church that remind me that Odessa Bible Church is alive, more alive than ever. As you can see, I'm wearing a face shield. And this is not kind of an April Fool joke. This is something that we are doing with the help and the collaboration of Elias Gray, who bring this beautiful idea to use his talent with a 3D printer to make these face shields to help doctors, nurses, and first responders to fight against this virus that is threatening us, that is putting us on risk. And this is amazing. When I asked him, why you are doing this? What are your motivations? He said, I'm doing this to glorify the name of God. And he used Psalm 33 verse 20 as a, a inspiration for his project. And the psalm said, our soul is waiting for the Lord, our help and our shield. And this is amazing. I feel so encouraged by him that I decide to talk about what is our shield for sin. I don't know if you know, but we are struggling with a virus long, long time ago in our life. And the name of that virus is sin. Sin is like a flaming arrow that the evil is launching to you in, in a way of thought. You start to think about something, then you became, that thought became in an action, and then that action became in a sin, and that sin produced death. 
This is a huge virus that we need to eliminate from our life. And the only way that we have to eliminate that virus is through Jesus. Jesus is the medicine. But at the same time, the Bible said that we have a shield to be protected against this virus. And the shield that the Bible said we have is our faith. Our faith is the shield that we can use to fight against this virus called sin. I want to read to you the book of James, chapter 1, verse 12, and said, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast on the trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. As you can see, those who stand firm on their trial are going to receive a crown of life. In Spanish, the word crown, you can say corona, coronavirus. So let's change the fear of coronavirus for the fearfulness, the fearless of the faith. And let's win the crown of life that God promised to those who love him. So I want to invite you to admit that you have this problem called sin and you need a solution for that. And I want to invite you to believe that Jesus is the solution for that problem. And I want to invite you to commit your life to Christ because he has beautiful plans for you. He's going to transform your lives once and for all. And you have to believe me. The best is yet to come. So thank you for watching. And if it's your first time listening to this message, I want to encourage you to text us, to communicate with us, because we want to know from you. We're going to, we want to help you in this journey. So God bless you and be safe. Well, hello, everybody, once again. I know you've already guessed where I'm at. I'm in my office. We wanted to do this outside again in my backyard so you can watch leaves fall and trash cans close, but it's too windy and cold on this Friday afternoon. It's about 2.30, so I hope your Friday is going well. I hope your Sunday's going even better. Uh, I tell you, it's, it's hard to do this without uh, you guys in the room. So Melanie's with me today, so if you hear her laugh, uh, in the background, uh, that's that's who's laughing at me or with me. Uh, it just depends. Um, on Monday this last week, I had to uh, practice social distancing for reasons beyond the virus. I uh, was just in a in a sour mood. You probably had this over the last couple of weeks. I was afraid of taking it out on my family, so I went to the church. Try to keep myself away from everybody. It's kind of quiet up here. Deborah's is here, but uh, there's not a whole lot of interaction around the whole building. And so I've had that day on Monday. Maybe you had it. Uh, and uh, we're social distancing and self-quarantine, shelter in place, homeschooling and drive through is just too much. And you just find yourself kind of cranky. Uh, and that was my, my, my Monday. And I know that many are suffering for another reason. And that's because of the uh, layoffs, the bust underneath of this whole coronavirus thing is an oil field bust, and it's caused a lot of people uh, more stress. And we haven't even talked about that in our community yet, but I know that's affecting a lot of you, and uh, it's devastating. And it's making us all deal with uh, the stress in unique ways. And for me, on that Mon this last Monday, I just kind of had to self-quarantine, find myself in alone, and uh, just work by myself. And for the last several weeks, I've been looking for the good in all of this. And it's, it's a challenge, but we know what Scripture says. It says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. It's a real easy verse to say when things are going well. Uh, and it's a little bit more of a challenge when it's not. And I know the verse is true. I know I love God. I know you love God. I know that we've been called according to His purpose. I know you've been called according to his purpose. So therefore, and thusly, what good is coming out of all of this? And what we are experiencing is pretty extreme, extreme trouble. And, uh, you know, in our culture, in our history as Americans, in our community, we, 
we've always had trouble. Uh, this isn't a time for a history lesson, but if you were to sit down and talk to any senior adult and ask them about the trouble that they have faced, they'll tell you long stories of trouble. I've talked to a, a few this week, and you'd be surprised at some of them who, who suffered greatly in the course of their lives. Uh, they've gone through trouble before. Uh, they'll tell you about those times, and they'll tell you about how God answered their prayers. And so here we are in the midst of that trouble, uh, difficult times, and John 16, 33 came to my mind as well. It said, I've told you these things so that in me, Jesus speaking, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. A few things to note about that. First, Jesus told us we would experience trouble. Uh, he knew this was coming and uh, told us about it. And the other part of that is to remember that he has overcome trouble. Uh, that he works through trouble. And the last part of that is to take courage, uh, that God is before us, Jesus has gone before us, and we just need to find a way to draw closer to him through these times of trouble. I've noticed that we pray a lot more. We read our Bibles a lot more together as our family. I hope that's true for yours. Uh, we love our church family more. We seek Christ more desperately. Uh, we seek the Lord in good times, that's true. But it seems that when it gets dark outside, when things get rough, we seek him even more. And uh, when we suffer, we really turn to the Lord. And when we suffer, when we struggle, when we deal with the unknown and are faced with fears, we are faced, uh, forced to seek Him. Uh, and that's something that could be positive that comes out of this. I believe that God shines the brightest when it's dark. No one notices the candle in a well-lit room. But when you turn the lights off and all those big bright lights go away, you, you are your eyes drawn to the light. And that's kind of what I feel like we're going through right now. It's when we are desperate is when we seek God and we truly look after Him. And so that takes me to another place inside of our story. We looked at the Garden of Gethsemane a couple weeks ago. Last week we looked at the courtyard of where Jesus went in the story of his his crucifixion, the passion of Christ, garden, the courtyard. This time we go to a hill, uh, which just outside of Jerusalem is a little hill called Golgotha or Calvary. Uh, we've been to those other places, but on this particular site is where it gets the darkest. It's the darkest moment in human history. Uh, it's found on that hill outside of Jerusalem. It was so dark uh, that it was even illustrated with that physical creation. In Luke 23, 44, it says that the sun stopped shining in that land. In other words, something came over the sun, and in Jerusalem, for this three hours of the Lord's crucifixion, it was dark. Uh, and it's in that environment that I believe that we see the greatest revelation of God in all of Scripture. I realize that Scripture says in Romans 1.20 that all of creation speaks of God's glory and who He is. It's undeniable. His invisible attributes, eternal power, and divine nature are all clearly seen in creation. But there's something about that hill just outside of Jerusalem where we really see God with incredible clarity. And if we can train our eyes to see God in that environment, environment. Maybe it can transfer into the environment that we're in today. If we can see God through the crucifixion of Christ in a whole new way, maybe we can train our eyes during this dark moment of perhaps unemployment, illness, some of you are sick, afraid of being sick, have a loved one who is sick, all of these things that we're wrestling with, that darkness that we feel, maybe we can find him a little bit more clearly. So I've wrestled a lot over the last few weeks about what to preach on during these times. Maybe I should uh, write <laughs> more jokes. <laughs> Maybe I should do a comical sermon. Maybe I should try to be more funny uh, that would kind of bring levity. But you have Netflix. You have all kinds of ways to find Jim Gaffigan or Jerry Seinfeld. For me, um, what I'd like for us to do is is try to find God in these dark times. And if we can look to Scripture uh, on the Easter story, maybe we can find, uh, train our eyes to seek God even in the dark. And so let's talk about this hill just outside of Jerusalem. Um, it's found inside the, the Gospels. Each one of the Gospels covers this. Uh, we'll be in a couple different ones uh, this morning. We'll kind of bounce around just a little bit. But a broad understanding of crucifixion is well known. Anyone who's seen a crucifix kind of gets the idea of what a crucifixion is. The details of a crucifixion, however, are not as well known. Mankind, uh, if you've watched or studied 
the history of torture. Uh, I've read a, a bit about that. I know it's kind of sick, but it's true. Um, mankind has always found incredible ways to be terribly mean uh, to those whom they deem unworthy of life, and uh, crucifixion is probably one, probably one of the worst. Um, and uh, allow me to give you some of the details. We know that uh, Jesus was crucified, uh, but before that happened, he was flogged. I did some looking into this this week and found out there are three forms of flogging or scourging in some texts might say. The lightest of these is called uh, fastigation, and that, that's a light whipping. It's something you might uh, give to somebody who is perhaps shoplifting or a petty crime. and It, it wasn't uh, meant to draw blood. Uh, the second one was flagellation. That one was a little bit more severe uh, for ser more serious crimes. Uh, and so those were two of the normal or lesser charges or kinds. And then there's the third one. It's called vibratio. Uh, this was the most brutal. The worst of criminals would receive this kind of scourging. Uh, and this is what Jesus experienced. He probably experienced the first two early on in the trial uh, that he went through, but he received this last one just before he was uh, crucified. And, and so you have Jesus going through this terrible experience of crucifixion. And the things that happen, uh, let's see, I think I got my notes out of order. The things I was reading inside of, there it is. I was reading inside of an um, article this last week uh, from Jim Caviezel. He was the, the actor who played Jesus in the movie The Passion. And he was given a, just a story of what it was like. He was discussing some scenes of him carrying the cross. Uh, as he was carrying the cross, he, out, out, out of Pilate's uh, praetorium and going outside the, the, the road to the, the hill, he, he slipped and he fell. And when he fell, the cross fell on him, and he actually bit through his tongue. Uh, all the way through it. And so if you watch the movie again, he says, watch it, you'll see blood coming out of his mouth. And that's real blood. Uh, he fought through the scene to keep the go, keep it going. And, but there's another part of that when he slipped. He, when he fell, uh, the cross landed on his shoulder and it knocked, it tore his, his tendons inside of his shoulder. So he was in excruciating pain as he was holding the cross. And it looks, he says, it looks like he's cherishing the cross in that scene in a very most beautiful way, but he's really doing it out of complete anguish and pain because he's bleeding from his mouth. His shoulder is popped out of socket and he's suffering. But then he talked about the experience of being, uh, portraying the act of being flogged. And uh, he says, you know, they tied his arms around the pole, and he's standing there, and they uh, began to go through that act. And of course, he's got all kinds of uh, gear on his back, so they're not actually striking him. But when they did that scene, one of the, the whips broke through that guard, and it actually hit his flesh. It put a 14-inch gash in his back. And he said he ripped his hands out of the, out of the uh, restraints and walked off the set. He could handle the cross. He could, have, he could fight through the pain of his shoulder, but when that whip hit his back and gashed through his, the flesh, he, it, it, he said it literally knocked the wind out of him. He could not breathe, and it left a scar on his back. And this is Jim Caviezel. He is surrounded by uh, a whole group of cameramen. He has lights. He has had a full night's sleep. Probably is prepared for this whole thing through physical training. He's got all. He knows that he's going to sleep in a nice trailer later on in that night, and he's been protected. And one whip sent him running off set. I'm not trying to diminish his toughness. I'm certain he's tougher than I am. It just informs me of what Jesus went through without any of those things. Most likely, Jesus had been up. Oh, he had actually been up for over 30 hours. He's walked two and a half miles. He's been standing most of the night. Uh, he, the last meal he had was at the Lord's Supper uh, that night. He's probably had little food, a little water. And remember, he knows all things that are going to come about. So he knows exactly what's going to take place. And there's no, there's no respite for him. He doesn't get to run off set. And so when I think about what Jesus went through and the things that he has suffered, it's overwhelming. Jesus will be hung on the cross around 9 o'clock in the morning, roughly. About 12 o'clock, that darkness that I mentioned will descend upon the earth. Middle of the day, it'll be completely dark. Think about that. Around 3 o'clock, he will cry out, it is finished. For six hours, he will suffer, bleed, and endure. Six long, brutal hours. When he gives up his spirit, he cries, it is finished. The ground shakes. Imagine that happening. We've, been, we've gotten a few earthquakes here. Um, but... 
when Jesus yells out, it is finished, the earth shakes and the rocks split open. Remember when Jesus said, if, if, if these will stop worshiping me, the rocks will cry out. Kind of a little bit's happening. Rocks will shake, the earth will shake, rocks will split. The temple veil is torn from top to bottom. And uh, Jesus breathes his last. And uh, the centurion who was there uh, overseeing the crucifixion of Christ has watched all of this take place. He's there the whole time. When he sees uh, Jesus say this, this is what he says. When the centurion and those who were with him were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they stood in the dark for three hours. And they saw all that was happening. They were terrified. And they exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. And I look at that and I think, is that the first statement of faith in Christ? Right there, right as he said, it is finished. The centurion takes the time to process that, and immediately he says, that was the Son of God. In other passages, it'll say, this is an innocent man. I think that centurion is the first one to come to Christ after the cross. Uh, what a powerful day will be to see him in heaven. And so, we have all this taking place, and that's not even the half of what Jesus went through. But Jesus has said in other passages, just before, in John 13, he says, I'm now going to glorify the Father. Father, glorify your Son so that I may glorify you. And to glorify means to make known, to reveal, to show the Father. And so how does all of this show the Father? This all points back to the Lord. Uh, the Lord Jesus wants us to see God clearly. It's dark. So what do we see in Christ, or the Father, through all of this? Several years ago, I read a book titled The Cross of Christ. It's 342 pages long, and it only deals with the crucifixion of Christ. Um, it's hard to believe there's anything left for anybody to write after 342 pages. Uh, it was. It's a great book. It's written by John Stott, and uh, I suggest you pick that up. It's a good one. But he writes all these things about God or the cross and what it did. And he has a section in there on just what this tells us about God. And I want to kind of highlight what, what he says there. He identifies three things that are revealed by the cross of Christ. The first thing about the cross of Christ and that it reveals about God and what it tells us about God is this, is that God is just. God is a just God. I grow weary of sin. I, I know you do as well. It's not just me. It's all of us. I grow weary of sin in me. I grow weary of sin around me. I grow weary of abuse, neglect, violence, and harm. I grow weary of selfishness, greed, theft, slander, gossip. I grow tired of this. Some of that's in me. I grow tired of sin. I hate it when evil goes unpunished or the weaker taken advantage of, and you're probably the same way. Colossians 3.25 says, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. I just wish that they would get repaid now, <laughs> don't you? Don't you wish that there was justice like right now? Well, in the forbearance of God, he allowed sin to pile up. All the way from Adam, all the way to the moment of the cross, all of that sin, and not just the sins of the past, it's the sins of the future. You see, Jesus died for all sin, past, present, and future. And so God had in view from the Old Testament all the way through the end of time, all of man's sin, and he was going to deal with it. He was going to take care of it right then and there, and he did. You and I have a deep craving for justice. We want justice, and we want it done in a visible way. We'd like to see it happen, uh, but we want justice, and it's a unique thing to human nature. My dog never worries about justice. He doesn't care about the food we eat. He doesn't care about fairness. He has no nothing about justice. You and I do. We have a craving for justice, and that's because we are made in the image of God. And God is going to bring about justice. And it is God, through the death of Christ, reveals to all mankind that there is justice. How easy it would have been for God to give sin a pass. Just look over. It's just a piece of fruit. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Maybe we'll ignore the fruit. How easy it would have been for him to overlook Cain's sacrifice that was done out of order. They just look past it. But God deals with sin in a very, very clear and, and very uh, abrupt way. It would be easy to be unjust, but it would be against God's character. And that craving for justice comes about inside of the crucifixion of Christ. He will deal with sin and its punishment, and he will not overlook its cost. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. That's an emphatical proof or thing that cannot be denied. He will deal with sin, and it will be in death. From the moment of the first sin to the, this very moment to the future, 
Nothing escapes the view of the cross. It has all been paid. God has paid for it, and he paid for it through Christ. He paid it himself. The only lacking part of it is when you apply it to your heart. And that payment must be applied to each person's account. It merely has to be accepted and then applied. And so God is just. God is a just God. And the results of his justice is what we have been brought close to him in Christ. It is through the cross we are able to come close to God. And we see his justice. Another thing that God does reveal to us is God is wise and powerful. You know, when you watch movies and TV, if you watch for a little while, uh, read novels or you know stories, it's hard to stay in the moment. I'm watching a show and I, I start to predict what's going to happen next. I can only do that because I've watched hundreds of these things and it kind of gets, it gets predictable. Uh, at the moment of, you know, when there's a, a tense moment, I can kind of anticipate what's going to happen next. We kind of learn how to do this, but nobody did this in the crucifixion of Christ. Nobody did. Who was present at that moment said, oh, don't worry about this. This is how it works out. Nobody thought that. Now, Jesus told them this is how it was going to work out, but they didn't remember it. and They didn't believe it. That's what happens when you go through trauma is you tend to forget what the word says. But they didn't have that moment. At the moment of his betrayal, trial, and crucifixion, nobody was saying, oh, this is going to end in this way. Nobody did that. It's what happens when you go through serious difficulties and, and struggles is you, you forget what you've learned. And that's what happened here. And so when you get to the end of the story, when you see what's going on, you, uh, you see that God in his wisdom and his power reveals himself through the cross. You see how smart and wise that God is. And you look back and you see the power and wisdom of God on full display. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. How is this? What greater display of God's power can there be found in the cross? He takes what is shameful and weak to display his power and his might. He does this by putting himself upon it in Christ Jesus. Nobody predicted that. Nobody saw it coming. Mankind stands below the foot of the cross and laughs at Jesus, and laughs at God as God is revealing himself to the world, that he is just, he is wise, and he is all-powerful. In that moment of darkness, God reveals his wisdom and his power. Only God could take something so much, with something so, could, I'm sorry, only God can make something so great out of something so awful. And that's what God did in the cross. And so all of man's wisdom would never contrive such a plan where God uh, would pay for sin and reveal his wisdom. God could punish us all to hell, and that would be just. But that would not reveal his wisdom and his power. It is God who makes a way to deal with both the penalty of sin and at the same time reveal his power and wisdom. He does it in a cross. I want to challenge you with something, something that I've read in that book, and it, it was really exciting to, to actually do. Uh, you can do this all day today. Start looking for the cross. I'm talking about a, a vertical beam with a horizontal beam. Look for it. Wherever you might be, look for the cross. And you will see it everywhere if you train your eye to look for it. I remember reading this with a friend, this book with a friend of mine, and leaving the restaurant we were at, and I started looking for the cross. I happened to drive down 8th Street that day. And if you drive down 8th Street, you will see the cross all down 8th Street. I'll give you a clue. It's attached to wires all the way down 8th Street. You'll see cross after cross. I get to take care of Jim Parker Little League Baseball Field when we get to play baseball, if we ever get to play baseball. But it's surrounded by crosses. Go there, you'll see it. There's crosses all over the place. Train your eyes to see the cross. And when you do, you'll see it everywhere and in everything. It's exciting to me. And it, it's just look for something that looks like that. People wear jewelry all the time. You see the cross and let it remind you that God is just, that God is wise, and that God is powerful. And when you begin to train your eye to see the cross everywhere, you'll begin to find that God's presence is all around you. It can't be uh, removed. Through the cross, Jesus reveals that God is just, and that God is wise, and God is powerful. And the last thing is probably the most obvious one, and that is that God is love. I get to do weddings, and it's, it's a lot of fun. I've done a lot of them. I've seen a lot of sweet couples share their vows. Some will write them. They'll go ahead and write the long story. Uh, some will just repeat them. All of them do it with great love and affection for their, their spouse. It's really sweet. 
One might even be tempted to say is, oh, look how much they love each other. And it's true. Without a doubt, it's true. But I've been on the other side of that marriage. I've seen a wife who's been married to him for decades. And she stands over him and says goodbye. And I'm positive that they had incredible love for each other when they got married. But that love had seasoned and matured. And when she's standing over that bed and kissing the, the forehead of her husband goodbye, I'll see you later. That love just grows. They've experienced life together. They've shared children. They've known each other with plenty. They've known each other through hunger. They've worried together. They've celebrated together. And she leans over and she gives him a sweet kiss and says, I'll see you soon then love starts to shine in a whole new way. It's a dark moment, but it's so filled with love. And for the last three and a half years, Jesus has been revealing the Father in all those bright moments. The feet of the 5,000, walking on water, raising the dead, feeling the broken. It's a wonderful, wonderful scene. But when you get to the cross, it's dark. But there's something that is so powerful about what God does there. The cross of Christ reveals that while God sees all of our sin, Every bit of it, even the sin that's in your heart right now, he sees it. He is still motivated by love to pay for it. Wrath, anger, injustice, all of that is set aside out of love. If God was only driven by wrath, anger, and justice, we would have been destroyed long ago. But God is driven by love. He knows the only way for you and me to be satisfied, to find joy and peace and purpose, is to see him clearly for who he is, then we begin to have a life that's worth living. We see a clear picture of him and his love. One of the verses I've been holding on to recently is found in 1 Corinthians 1.17. That whole section is, talks about the supremacy of Christ in all things. But this last part in 17 says that Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things, including all the, the things that we're going through right now. All things hold together, and they were being held together so that we might see the Father who is just, who is wise and powerful, and He's filled with love for us. We find our greatest life, most satisfying life, most fulfilling life, by seeing the Father clearly. When He is seen, then we are satisfied. When we train our eyes to find Him in the midst of darkness, we'll then discover that God is just, is wise and powerful. If he can take a cross and turn it into something beautiful, he certainly can take a virus. He can certainly take an oil bust. He can certainly take uncertainty and all these things and turn it into something beautiful. He can always turn things uh, into a way that we can grow closer to him. I know it's been dark for the last few weeks. I fear that it might get a little bit darker. Um, I know it's, it causes anxiety. I know it causes stress. and I know that some have lost their jobs, a sense of well-being, and are striving to find a new normal, at least some kind of consistency. I don't have a magic wand, and I don't know if it would be the right thing to do to wave it to make it all go away. Because God does. He can make all this go away, but he hasn't. Why not? Maybe it's through all of this, when it gets so dark, that we see him clearly. Maybe it's through all of this that we learn to train our eyes to look for Christ in everything. And so I want to challenge you with this uh, this week. Train your eyes. Even if it's just driving down the street, look for the cross. Just look for it and allow it to draw your heart back to Christ. Because I know it's stressful. But look for the cross. It's literally everywhere you look if you just train your eyes. Look for that vertical beam with a horizontal beam towards the top. Look for it. You'll see it in window frames, power pole signs. Every time you see the letter T, you'll see a cross. I see a cross. Look for it in that moment of stress and anxiety. And when you go on that walk, look for a cross. Don't look for the teddy bears. Look for the cross. You'll see a cross in all of these things. You'll find it to be nearly everywhere you look if you look for it. So look for him. If we can find a clear picture of God, to the cross of Christ on a little hill outside of Jerusalem. Can we find God moving around us even today? We find his justice, we find his wisdom, we find his power, and we can find his love. And maybe we'll help if you just look for the cross. We see love better in the dark. I don't pray for darkness. I don't really even like the dark. However, 
It's where love shines the brightest. And if it and it never shined as brightly as it did on a hill just outside of Jerusalem. Can we pray? Father, I thank you for my church. I miss them. I pray that you bless them today as they as they gather together in their homes with their families. I pray that you would encourage their hearts. And may we all look to the cross, wherever we might find it, and be reminded and see you clearly in all things. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, thank you all for being with us today. Before I let you go, I want to tell you something that I find to be very exciting. You're inside of our Discovery Zone. This is a 2,300 square foot room that we use to close for Awana uh, on Wednesday nights. And we don't really use it on Sunday mornings because it doesn't have the right equipment in it. Uh, and so we've been praying about that and just asking the Lord to meet that need of filling this room with the right equipment. And this last week, a, a friend of Odessa Bible Church uh, said we would like to fund this room and make it something special. It cost about $10,000 and they gave us a gift to make it special. And so this is what we're planning on doing with this, is that this will have a stage right here. We'll put speakers and TVs on the top there. There'll be a TV that will hang here so you can see what's on the screens behind you. And it will be a, a wonderful space for Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings because when we start the Spanish church over uh, in the youth room, we need a place to do uh, children's church and, and this will be that place and it will be another platform that we can use with kids on Wednesday night. So I am so excited about what this room is going to be and it was a gift that was given specifically to make this room something special. And what would really be cool, and this is just because I like to plus things, is this wall right here is awfully brown. And uh, we did some looking into this wall here too. And it, wouldn't it be cool if this was a rock wall and where kids could climb and a, a way around the wall, not high, but just across the wall there, all the way to the other side. And so they would start here and they would go around the corner. We would hide the pipes and it would go around those windows and it would end on that side. And they would probably get about five feet off the ground and we put nice soft padding for those who would fall. And it would be able to be a, a whole room would be just a great space. But we want to do that next that would be about four thousand dollars but the stage area would all be done with about ten thousand but there's something else that is neat too because within that amount of money we're able to make something special out here that uh, this is our play lounge and that play lounge over there, we can put a TV on that wall and some speakers. It would be overflow for our uh, worship service, but then it would also be something we use the right now media and, and things like that. And we got kids playing and they're, they're socially distanced and they're safe. But uh, it would be a great space there too. So that's going to happen as well. So I hope that when we all come back together again to celebrate what God's done here, that these two rooms will be in great shape. I know they will be for the summer and especially as we get looking towards next year in Awana and what happens. So God bless you this week. Great things are happening. We praise the Lord for that, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great week. Bye-bye.